Okay. Uh, in the spirit of entertainment, I'm gonna begin with a poem. This mic's very loud, so I'm gonna hold it a long way for my friends to come out here. I'm gonna begin with a little bit of a poem or a rap, as some of you may call it. And I'm gonna unpick that a little bit for about five, ten minutes before we open up and continue. It goes like this. Sorry, kids, let me apologize before I go further. Unfortunately, I don't rap about how many blacks I'm murdered. And some may find it boring and poor in the night, scoring blacks from the little rap packs to merely stating facts. Lack not ability to murder man lyrically. Just for killing shouldn't be glorified. Silly me. Apparently, murdering man has become an aspiration. But what would happen if you reverse the situation? And all these black rappers claim and they clap a black in the face. Rapped about killing white people as much. Would they still get embraced? Or would you find it applauding? We'll quickly turn to appalling and you've got no career here by the next morning. I ain't saying we should do that. That ain't gonna help us free our sons. Just pointing out how absurd that it has become. If a Chinese rapper were to say, die, ching, die, even we would be like, what is wrong with this guy? But some of us have become so accustomed to just behave disgusting. We think it's just our behavior and it ain't worth discussion. Or worse yet, that is cultural expression. But who owns Beretta? And who owns Smith & Wesson? Who owned the cars which I have enough things defining who we are? We're running from ourselves and finding no hiding so we can boast about our Prada and our Christian Dior. Still, security will follow us when we're in the store. And we can boast about our platinum chains and little diamond rings. Our kids in Sierra Leone keep on losing limbs, act like we got no brain and we ain't got no shame. And say, so what? I'm getting double whipples in the game. They're laughing and the little. We really think that goons, real goons, don't wear platinum chains, they wear ties and suits. They don't live in the states and sell flake. They invade with guns and tanks and take your whole state. Mate, so pardon me if I don't find it funny. We boast about it, but do we even know what is money? See, it's hard to act dumb when you've read a couple hundred books. But still, in anybody so to tell me who is shook. When you've been to Brazil and stood in favela streets, next to kids holding hand grenades and M16s, when you come back to London, it ain't serious. We make it more ghetto with the way we think, like with the lyrics. If we lived in the real slums with our food or running water, where police drive by and kill sons and daughters, we give up my arms just for the chance to go to school instead. What do we do? The kid is gonna play the fool and I ain't saying school is the answer. Educate yourself. See, it's not the money you make, you are the wealth. And I ain't saying we ain't gotta struggle by it here in Britain. Don't we talk to act in theory and play position perfectly? It's disturbing me, the verb murder me, absurd to me, it occurred to me if you have not heard of me. It's probably because I don't rap about Gucci and Ruby. Quiet enough for the urban scene to fully salute me, but I don't really care. I'm too busy writing on master thesis. It's hard to play the stereotype when you study Egypt. Plus, the urban scene are racist to ourself, and then they're making words of hate with merely hating ourselves. And if you are musically broad and dare to speak intelligent, people look at you like, who the hell do you think you better? I'm better than the one on this earth, and I know I'm not, but I refuse to play small just to fit in their words. And I don't hate none of the other rappers, in fact, it's quite the other. Look at me as your bigger, wiser, older brother. And as a brother, should I tell you you're in trouble? If they clap when you celebrate killing, do they really love you? If record label bosses, kids were dying with their cell spines, or the they're ready to desensitize, they tell you to shit on the floor, holding all the scoops, throw us a bone like a dog jumping through a hoop. Don't take it as a compliment, because it is not that. If I tell you that you're African, you tell me it's not that. But humanity is African, even if not black, the truth can be painful. You better stop that. It's so inconvenient for those at the top that you talk too much truth, you might just get popped at. And if women are such hoes that we don't want to kiss them, what does it say about us that we still want to put up? See, I'm done with the lies, but I ain't open wide. See, the tougher that you act, the weaker you really feel inside. So all the killer, the trigger, and when we call ourselves a more platinum chains bigger than jiggers, it's just to run from the fact that we feel insecure, get as many things as you want, but it cannot restore the core of who you are truly. That will surpass beauty. That comes from knowledge of yourself and a sense of duty. So all my brothers still claiming that we are tough. No, if we're honest, we just want to be loved. But we feel that we're not worthy and that we're not smart. So we act aggressive to protect our fragile little hearts, but we've got to deal with this pain or we can consume. That's enough honesty. Let's resume. Turn this off, go back to rappers that tell us kill. But inside of ourselves, we know that this is real. A car, this was from SPTV. Double fix out now, check the CD. If you want a little knowledge bigger than college, I promise you the metaphorics that will offer you solid like The Great Pyramid alone has 2.3 million stones. If you took them apart and placed them in a row, they would stretch two thirds of the way around the earth. That is more stone than it is in every single British church ever, dating ever. Each stone cut with a degree of accuracy of one one thousandth of an inch. Well, what does that mean? In 1978, the Japanese ran an experiment to rebuild it with modern technology and failed terribly. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> I 
suppose I'm picking what I just performed and some of the role, because we talk about education, for me, a central part of my education as a young man growing up was hip-hop. Without a Wu-Tang Clan, without Public Enemy, without these voices, without Gregory Isaacs and Dennis Brown for them. That was part of my education to me, and a much more positive and intrinsic and necessary part than a lot of what I learned in school, but it's never looked at as that way. Reggae music was an education. The first time I heard the name Marcus Garvey was from Berlin Spear, right? And, um, and so I think it's continuing that real tradition and understanding what role culture plays in our education. But I'm going to reflect for a little minute on some of my own experiences in school and just some of my thoughts about where we're at today. Education in the African diaspora generally, not just in Britain, um, in relation to Robert Simeon's question. So there's one personal anecdote um, I want to share from primary school because I think it's quite significant. It's not the only incident of this kind that happened. It's not the most horrific. It's just one particular incident that I was thinking about when I was planning what I was going to talk about this morning. And I think it relates to the system of education and what I like to call the white mythologies that we're all encouraged to ingest and believe and are, are promoted from a very young age. And actually, I would argue, do a lot of damage even to young white students and their ability to see the world in more human terms. I was seven years old and I went to, I was a product of the black supplementary school movement. I went to the Winnie Mandela School in Camden growing up. So I had a certain amount of self knowledge even very young. I knew who Nanny of the Maroons was, I knew that the Haitian Revolution had existed, even at this point. I'm just giving you context for this point. We went to the National Portrait Gallery in my school, and there was a picture of William Wilberforce on the wall. And my teacher, of all the students in the class, I wasn't the only African Caribbean student in the class, she pulled me aside and said, Did you know, Kingsley, this man stopped slavery? And I said, Miss, all by himself. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's the worst of it. Right? I, I said, uh, I said, don't you think maybe you had some help or some other people had some input? <laughs> now, what was interesting was her response. She didn't say, yeah, maybe. She got angry with me. She was Canadian. She said, no, Kingsley, he stopped saying that. And my point is, is that when you don't have the equipment to challenge these mythologies, right, you, are, you go through school and just ingest them. When you do have the equipment to challenge them and your, your parents or your community equips you with them, the reactions you get back are quite interesting and quite profound. And this was just one of a million examples I could give, some of which were much worse, that I thought was quite funny. Uh, a teacher would get so incensed by the idea that someone other than William Wilberforce played a role in ending uh, that massive transatlantic system. Um, but that's how powerful one individual white man is. He can wave his wand and it's all done. Um, but I suppose, even the question of education today, what is, as Robert Simon said, well-educated? How do we define what is well-educated? Um, what are the terms by which success in education is viewed. If I get a good job, I go and work at a bank in the city, I move away from my community and I live in Richmond or you know, Hounslow or wherever else, is that success? I have plenty of friends, African Caribbean friends who've done that and believe that they are successful even whilst their home territories and home countries continue to be victims of neo-colonialism, continue to govern in a language that is not their own. Could you imagine any self-respecting Anglo-Saxon person being comfortable with England being governed in Europe, for example, right? You laugh because it's that ridiculous, but we have people that believe we are successful even whilst we're in these kinds of uh, situations. So I would question even the notion of success in this system that we are fed, what that even means for the community as a whole and who sets those goals. And beyond even just an African Caribbean perspective uh, particularly, but a general failure, how many people, just raise your hand, if you learned to plant food when you were in school? Basic sustenance, if you learn to farm while you're in school. Okay, more than I thought, about 15% of the audience. The most basic thing to be able to provide yourself with food, clothing, and a shelter. Who learned how to build a house in school? To build any sort of basic shelter. So when we're talking about even beyond just uh, the racial implications of growing up in a racialized society, basic things that I would argue an education system should be providing people to learn, we're not leaving. Who learned what a mortgage was in school? Was it ever explained to you what a mortgage actually was, how it worked? Okay. Um, and so moving on from that, looking at a more global perspective, we have certain issues here in the UK that are not exclusive to the UK, coming back to an African Caribbean perspective. Because contrary to popular mythology, black people in America are not prospering. In many ways, they're in some of the worst circumstances they've been in in the last century. The towns like Black Wall Street, the Tulsa, Oklahoma, and all of that progress, the Harlem Renaissance that was destroyed in the 1920s and 30s, and now this post-civil rights uh, movement euphoria, especially with the person that now occupies the White House, the reality for the average African-American is no better than it was 100 years ago. I'm not saying that for hyperbole, I'm saying it because it's a fact. 
There is a genocide going on in the south side of Chicago right now. No one's talking about it. The levels of violence in New York, in LA, in every major center of black urban populations in America are as bad as they've ever been. The new Jim Crow, a wonderful book by Michelle Alexander I recommend you read, looking at the mass incarceration of African American and Latino males, none of this is coming up because apparently black people made it in America. We got well educated, we became Bill Cosby, and everything was wonderful. And these are the mythologies that success, the mythologies of success are so dangerous because of that. You can go to Brazil, you're going to find a similar situation. The favelas haven't been knocked down and rebuilt. Those people haven't been properly integrated into Brazilian society. Even where my grandmother's family from, um, Jamaica. I read an article in the Gleaner last year that Marcus Garvey had been added, finally added, to the curriculum in Jamaica. And I want you to think about that. Think about that. 72 years after the man's death, the man who unified more, not himself, because I don't believe in one individual making history, but the man who represents the movement that unified more African people than any other movement ever in history, unquestionably one of the most significant African people of the last century and a half. 72 years, is that 20? 72 years after his birth to be added to the curriculum in Jamaica, the country that he was born in. Now how many people who are of no relevance to the majority of African Jamaicans are still on that curriculum? But they'll consider themselves successful, they graduate university, they have degrees, and maybe they feed into a particular system, a system that doesn't teach basic self-determination to the majority of the peoples in that country. And so I suppose my rough conclusion is that we're not, in my opinion, better educated than our parents. We're not worse educated. We're facing the same dilemmas in a different and morphed way and the same challenges. And I think to believe that this current system that depends on our ignorance, that depends on African Caribbean people particularly, behaving economically in a way that not a group of people behaves, you will never go to Southwark in a million years and find a row of shops owned by Jamaicans and people patronizing them to buy the products of Punjabi culture. You're not going to see it as long as you show them. And if you do, please take a photo. You're never, another, another scholar made a point, I can't remember who it was, but you're never going to see Chinese people queued up around the block every Friday night to come and eat African food. No disrespect, you're just not going to see it. Go to any Chinatown anywhere in the world, and who's there? And that's not a, to disrespect any other culture. Cultural interaction, I respect. Cultural absorption and domination, I don't respect. And so all, none of those things are being taught and are being laid down. And when African Caribbean people talk about practicing group economics, talk about practicing the basic things that any community with common sense in my group community would practice, because oh, it's reverse racism, you can't do that, you can't talk about it. Do people, do people of European origin in Zimbabwe speak Shona? Do they integrate with the community there, or do they have their own autonomous community separate? Do Chinese people come here and do it? No one complains. But when African Caribbean people talk about self-determination, talk about being educated to solve their own problems, there's a fear. Because there's, in my view, a cognizance that this particular system depends on certain groups of people being kept at the bottom of So I would argue that in moving forward, we face the same challenges as our parents and need to react in the same way that the best of our parents reacted, setting up supplementary schools, organizing for self, teaching our children and be dogging and determined in doing that, and that will bring about our own success and liberation. Continue this one. Thank you. Well,